morning. Um, I'm Paul Harris from Integrated Energy Solutions and um, this morning I'm going to try and give some of the context behind the topic and that relates to the Eskom bank account, how are we ever going to pay and how are we going to demand the electricity that the guys are choosing to build at the moment. Morning, I'm Sadiq Davis. I'm a nuclear engineer with Eskom. My aim is to use Kubel's current performance in terms of reliability, safety and cost as a precursor for what, for what nuclear will look like in the future. Morning, I'm, I'm Davin Chan. I'm the chairperson of the South African PV Industry Association and I sit on the board of the South African Renewable Energy Council. Essentially, I'll be giving you a view on why the independent power producer program and renewables has been working for South Africa, what it's been delivering, how it's been delivering and what we believe the future to be as South Africa starts to embrace, as many other parts of the world have, renewables in a much more uh, comprehensive manner. Um, Jak has asked me to, to be part of this and the business school asked me and I can just tell you up front I'm not a nuclear specialist nor am I a renewable specialist but I have a I have a particular mantle that I wear is that I try and look after the South African consumer and at the end of the day it's the South African consumer that is going to have to pay for whatever is ordered by the DOE, whatever is built by Eskom, etc. So what I'd like to do then in my little 10 minutes is paint a picture of the context within which these decisions are being made. Is that okay? So it's the context within which these gentlemen will then talk about their particular interests and whether we should go this way or that way. But I think it's critical for us as a, as a, as a country to, to, to understand what is the realities that we're dealing with at the moment. So I'm going to try and use the flip chart a little bit as well, but, um, but that gives you an idea of what I'll be covering. So this is obviously very topical at the moment, the issue of renewables and the issues of nuclear as we head towards the signing of another round of contracts. We have the round four on the, on the, on the solar and wind program that they're trying to get signed at the moment. And we've got a lot of talk by Eskom that they're wanting to build some more nuclear capacity and bring that on, bring, bring that on stream. <clears throat> the question we need to ask is, who's going to be paying for that? <laughs> Do we need it? And when will we be needing it? And perhaps those are bigger questions than which one we should actually be building. And so let me try and explain to you the realities of what we're dealing with in South Africa at the moment when we ask those questions. Um, just put your minds to one side and think about electricity for a minute. The electricity industry is a massive part of our country. It's a massive part of our economy. Eskom alone last, in their last financial year turned over 168 billion rand. It's a very big part of our economy. And it covers everything from all of the power stations that are stretched across the country, right through the whole grid, and connect via the municipalities to every single householder, industry, etc. That is what we're dealing with when we talk about the electricity industry. Let's dive down into a few of the aspects of them, and I'm going to put up a few of the stats on the board here. But the first point I want to make is in the middle of all of this that people don't realize is there's effectively only one bank account. At the end of the day, all of the money that we pay for the electricity in our homes or industry gets paid perhaps to a municipality, but then it goes on to the Eskom bank account. There's only one bank account in South Africa to pay for all of this. That bank account has to pay for all the stations, all new stations, all the fuel has to pay for all these IPPs that are being built at the moment, solar, wind and any future nuclear plant. There's one bank account that has to pay for all of it. And that bank account is taking a little bit of strain at the moment. Let me explain why. Firstly, in any business we need to look at sales. So what have been Eskom and the country's electricity sales over the last eight years? So if we go to the Eskom annual reports and we look at 2008, to the one of last year, which is 2016, I'm battling with this marker, um, and we see what happened to sales. Anyone got a better marker for me? Sales, is it better? Sales then have reduced from 224 to 214 terawatt hours over the eight years. Can I use that one? Thank you. So the sales have decreased by minus 4.4%. Sales have actually declined. The demand for electricity on the highest winter night has reduced as well from about 35.4 down to 34.5 over the eight years. 
So sales have actually declined in the last eight years and have not gone up at all. The next thing we have to understand is that through the same time, why has this taken place? Why have sales declined? And what's going to be happening in the future? Sales have declined because South Africa is part of the world's economy and has had a bit of a cold from, the, from an economic sense. And we no longer buy as much electricity as we, as we used to. We don't have the manufacturing. There's been so much plant closure. On top of that, we have put on solar panels onto our roofs. We make hot water from PV, uh, from, from solar. We've put some PV panels on. And we turn around to our spouses and we say, please turn off the heater because electricity has become too expensive. Electricity is now price elastic, it means as the price goes up, what we buy goes down. And all of these factors are causing the flat lining of sales over the last eight years. I don't know where we're going to get more from if you think of our economy at the moment and even what's happening with regards to our junk status. It's going to have an impact. But just remember, at the same time, the average price has gone from 19 cents up to 76 cents. So the price of electricity has gone up by a factor of almost four over the same period. And we've got to say, why has why that gone up? Well, the first thing is it's not the new plant that we built. The issue is what have been the operating overheads of Eskom. The biggest operating overhead in Eskom is their, their, their primary fuel expenses, which have gone up um, from, from, from the primary fuel has gone up from 18 to 85. So you just get the numbers, 18 to 85 billion rand a year. 18 to 85, that's what's happened to all their primary energy costs, straight out of their annual reports up to March last year. The bottom line is that the expenses have increased and increased. Their staff numbers have gone up from 35 to 48,000 over the same period but there's been less kilowatt hours generated for customers and sold at the end of the day. Operating expenses have really increased in Eskom over those eight years. The last point I want to make about this is that included in the 85 billion is the IPP payments for the solar and wind plants that have been put in. Now I understand the price may go down in the future, but currently in the annual report, if you look at the amount of kilowatt hours that are purchased, nine, nine Divided by the cost that Eskom is paying, it's one rand 67 a kilowatt hour that they paid in, that financial, in the last financial year. This average selling price is 78 cents, 76 cents. So they are losing more than double on every kilowatt hour that they buy. Eskom in the last financial year, included in here is the IPPs, which are equivalent to 9.2% of their turnover. In other words, 9.2% of the money coming in goes straight out to the IPPs before they've paid for any of their own things. This is what's driving the Eskom bank account to the point where we had to top up by 28 billion rand last year by selling the Vodacom shares as a country. Do you remember that? We had to top up by 28 billion into the business. Their debt, Eskom debt, has gone from 100, from 100 billion to 480 billion in the same period. Of that, of that, about 400 of it is long-term debt, with a still needing to finish, Kusili Madupi is going to be another 250. Eskom is going to top out at about 650 billion rands worth of debt, half of which is underwritten by the government, that you and I are really accountable for, accountable for at the end of the day. That's before we build anything more, guys. And on top of that, the IPPs, off balance sheet financing, have added another 200. Same as buying a photocopier. You lease it, it's off balance sheet financing. That's what they have over 20 or 30 years through the IPPs. That's the financial realities of what we're dealing with in Eskom today. Their production capacity, almost done. Just so we got a picture. The production capacity in the last year's annual report was at 46 gigawatts. That's what the nominal capacity is that they can generate. They're busy bringing on another 10,000 at the moment, 10, 10 gigawatts because of Madupi, Kusili, etc., etc. That should, if you look in the next few years, by 2021, I think it is, will go up to 56 gigawatts. 56. Against a demand of 34 or 35 at the moment. 
And even if there's going to be some growth in our economy, there's just no way that that is not going to be sufficient to cover for that. And I understand that they are going to have to retire some plant. Yes, that will be taken into account. But there really is, and that is why today Eskom is desperately starting to sell power. We're back to where we were in the 80s, where we ran around trying to sell power because we had too much capacity. Last point I want to make then, before I sum it up, is what I'm saying here is Eskom really has enough capacity to last us many years. The sales are flatlined. The last issue then becomes one of environmental. People would say, well, let's shut the coal stations to improve the environmental thing in South Africa. Guys, there's many things we need to do. We need to talk about what are the real things that will impact us environmentally as a nation. Are we prepared to challenge Sassel and shut Sassel, which is the biggest polluter in our country? We can just import the stuff from the Middle East at the same price, because our price is based on an average. The BFP is based on that. So we could shut Sassel tomorrow and not affect our petrol price, and we would greatly reduce our carbon footprint. The issue with Eskom is we have all the coal stations. All we have to do is one pipeline from Pemba in northern Mozambique, and we can refire them all on natural gas. Natural gas has half the carbon footprint of coal. Half, if that's what we want to do. There are other ways of doing it. And then, of course, the other two things environmentally would be how much of us are talking about energy efficiency, energy conservation, which are the cheap things to do before we start switching to solar and wind, etc. We are not doing those effectively as a nation. We can probably save another 20 or 30 out of that in terms of what we're using at the moment if we really, really are serious about greening our nation. So where does this wrap us up? I've probably got a minute. So where does this wrap, wrap up? So firstly, as we talk about the two options here, can we remember that there's one bank account? That bank account has taken so much strain that they added the 28 billion in last year as a top up from government. That makes SAA look like chicken feed if you talk 28 billion as those sort of amounts of money. And once you start top-ups, it's very difficult to stop. The issue is there's just increasing overheads, increasing IPP costs. These are just going to continue to go up. That's the reality of what that bank account is dealing with at the moment. Then, I understand the older plant are, 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 are going to get nearer the end of their life, and there's a lot of talk of shutting Creel and all the others at the moment. Come on, guys. For any family, that's got the kids now going to varsity, and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the salaries are very level, and there's an increase in interest rates. What do you do? Do you, do you sell your old car and you buy a new one and argue about whether you should do diesel or petrol? The issue is you keep your car going as long as you can, can't you? Because economically, that makes the most sense. The bottom line for us as a country, what we're needing to do is take some really prudent decisions at the moment. Those prudent decisions will be to utilize the plant that we have as long as possible, to delay the building of anything new, to delay, forgive me, even the solar and wind contracts as long as we can, because we don't need them right now. We're running around trying to sell the stuff. We need to delay all of that, and the decisions of those are based on an IRP that was probably determined in the late 2000s. And the minister's determination then was to order these. I really question that, and I want us to keep this as a background as we listen to the next two speakers. Thank you, Yaku. My intention really is to put some facts on the table, to try and disentangle nuclear from the narrative of corruption or uh, forcing an agenda, and really to put the case across that I've been part of for these 28 years, or, which is that nuclear is a cheap, safe option. And that's not based on theory or projecting into the future. That is dominated, it's predicated on the experience at Coburg. So my 10 minute discussion here is what is Coburg? And then how might that be extrapolated into the future? So the first bit, a little bit of a, a one minute uh, crash course on nuclear. We generate electricity like any other plant by turning a generator that's represented here. The generator is driven by a steam, a steam turbine, and the steam is condensed through a condenser similar to any other uh, conventional power station. Steam is produced in a kettle, call it the steam generator, but the difference is that the heat, the primary energy, comes from nuclear fuel. So you can see that the nuclear system is isolated from the environment 
both through the water systems here, as well as the containment. Where does the energy come from? Base material is uranium ore that is then chemically processed into what ultimately becomes that little fuel pallet. These fuel pallets are about this big. These are stacked into what we call zerk alloy rods and built into a fuel assembly. That fuel assembly is roughly four meters long. And in the Kubrick reactor, we load approximately 158 or so of those. Nuclear waste, which is a big question to, and it should be, a big question for all. What we, we have three categories of waste. One is low, one is intermediate, and one is high level waste. Most societies, most people don't appear to be bothered by low or intermediate level waste. But just for your information, these are stored. Uh, my apologies for that. These are stored at foul pits currently in open trenches, low level waste compacted into steel drums and intermediate level waste into concrete drums. And th these are stored in open trenches at uh, the site called foul pits. Rightly so, society is bothered by the high level waste. We store the high level waste, which is used fuel. We store it in wet storage. The, this is a, a poor picture, but this is a wet pool. And once that pool is, uh, is full, we put it in casks about that size. And we currently have four at Coburg, and we plan some more in the near future. We then stick it into dry storage. It stays there for a number of years. And then the final solution, not to decide in South Africa, will either be reprocessing or more likely direct disposal in a geologically stable area. Now, the quantum of that waste really comes from understanding a little bit about that little pallet um, that's about this size. That's the equivalent of three barrels of oil, ton of coal, 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. The quantum of input energy, therefore, is substantial. So you get a lot of energy from a, a very small source. By deduction, then, the waste is similarly small. So I'm not uh, arguing that the waste is not toxic, not at all. But the quantum of waste produced in nuclear is very small. And I mean very small for the substantial amount of energy produced. So roughly, a uh, sort of back of a fact, back some sees that if you ran 60 reactors, or sorry, five reactors for 60 years, you could store all the high level waste in one Olympic size swimming pool by volume. So it's toxic, but small in quantity. At Kuburg, what South Africa has here that is supplying the bank account that Mr. Ira spoke about. Two unit pressurized water reactors, total of 1,860 megawatts, so half per unit. Been in commercial operation since 1984. Um, initial design for 40 years, but we've put in place um, engineered uh, features to take it to 60 years. And possibly beyond my career lifetime, others will take it to 80 years. We are part of an international club that does peer reviews and scores us. So in terms of our international status, we are in the top half of nuclear performers. So a little bit more. Uh, it's a base load plant. In other words, it runs 24-7. These were the records when we produced this presentation. But this number on Unit 2 has now gone up. Uh, um, about a, a week ago, we took it down for refueling. That's now 492 days, continuous 24-7 baseload operation. So they've also been online simultaneously for record periods in, in, in recent years. It's a very safe plant. NOSCO implies personnel safety. Uh, WANO is World Association of Nuclear Operators. That is the club I told you that we're part, about, we're part of, and Kubik is rated um, uh, right at the top. Our training programs are internationally accredited, and that is quite unusual for, um, for plants outside of the United States. Now, this is a bit of a complicated graph. I do apologize for that. So I'm not going to uh, um, take you through all the, you know, the vertical and horizontal axes and so on. The, the horizontal one is easy. It's just time. What this red line here is, that is the IA, the International Atomic Energy Association, uh, measure the minimum safety level for existing plants, that's the red line. The blue line is the same, but for new plants. So when you start a plant, it's got to be measured at this level of safety. So lower is better on this graph. We started out over there. 
the time of construction, and through countless billions of investment, we brought it down to better, safer than the standard for new plants. So your Kuburg plant out there in Malpostrand is a very safe plant, not just reliable. If we sectionalize the grid and supply it only the Western Cape, Kuburg supplies 50%. Of course, it's an interconnected grid, so that is a bit of a moot point. The net current uh, effect to the country of Kuburg is a very low cost of production. Now, Mr. Harris made a very important point. He said ESCOM got into a little bit of financial difficulty because of the primary cost or the, the cost of primary energy. He's absolutely right. That's the cost of coal. And when the coal plants were not performing, it includes the cost of gas. The cost of gas nearly bankrupted ESCOM. So why people talk about cheap gas confounds my mind. Recently, we asked KPMG to do a, an economic impact assessment of, of the Kuwait power station. In other words, what is the broader impact of this plant? I'll give you some uh, numbers a little bit later. But effectively, the contribution of a plant like that to the quality of jobs and the creation of jobs is quite substantial. It's also a business that is predicated on math and science and technology. So the downstream effects of the development uh, um, in that is also significant to the growth and poverty alleviation in the country, or breaking, as I think of it, the poverty trap. Kuburg Power Station is run by South Africans from all walks of life, races, socioeconomic backgrounds, and that creates the socioeconomic dividend that I personally am very proud of. So some people say nuclear um, is an elitist environment. I say, yes, it is, unapologetically. You need to have a certain degree of skill and education and so on. But it's elitist, not for the elite. You come from anywhere, you understand math, science, technology, all of that, and nuclear is for you. I don't know if you can see from the back, but this is the result of the KPMG study. And I have to tell you this. I briefed them and said this is an exercise in truth-telling. Nuclear is not a business of spin. One minute. Um, they had no disclaimers on, on the veracity of the information, and they defended this report themselves. The jobs uh, created by the little purple thing there is, let's call it 2,000 people employed by ESCOM, impact 19,000 jobs in the Western Cape, 30 billion to the economy. Uh, in the rest of South Africa, 23 billion. That's in a three-year period, 2012 to 2015, 16,000, et cetera, et cetera. You got the picture. It's a substantial business. Plants in operation around the world, 450. Look at the names. So the names, the correlation between those names, in my mind, and economic well-being is clear. The richest countries in the world have nuclear. Moreover, if you look at the plants under construction, the countries that are growing in the world want nuclear and are building nuclear. Why? Why are they doing that? So all of the world's major economies, except Germany, who is the biggest carbon emitter in Europe, keep the nuclear option open. Uh, there are new entries, Turkey, Belarus, Poland, Bangladesh, and countless others in Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, Kenya. These are serious guys who want to have, will they have it? I don't know, perhaps not in my lifetime, but I know for certain that they absolutely want it at government level. Saudi Arabia, oil rich, sun rich, uh, rich in general, but they want nuclear. So my simple uh, answer is that they want it because it adds to an energy mix that gives self-sufficiency in a way that is not only affordable, but in fact, <coughs> profitable. So I, I don't think I'm gonna go into too much detail on this because I don't know the detail. This is time now. This is the medium term outlook that Mr. Harris was referring to, a flat line in growth. This is what might happen. Simple analogy is that if this is indeed the growth that we have, I don't know if it will be or won't be, and we don't have base load capacity. I think all of you know the effect of that because you've experienced load shedding. These are the, these are the ESCOM uh, uh, models for retiring plant, and these are not produced by nuclear people. Nuclear is this small in ESCOM. ESCOM is a coal, uh, um, a fossil-based organization, effectively. So our planners say that our coal plants will retire at this rate. You don't have to look at the detailed numbers but you can see that it's quite a steep curve of retiring plant. A quick graph on, we call it the cost of penetration, and that is how difficult is it to do smart grids and introduce 
other forms of energy onto the grid. Because renewables effectively are not what we call dispatchable, they come and go as a function of the vagaries of weather and climate and all that type of thing. The cost of penetration for renewables is quite high when compared with coal, gas, and nuclear. So in conclusion, governments of most major and emerging economies have or want nuclear energy because it strengthens baseload generation or dispatchable generation and it's profitable. All protagonists aim for an optimal mix and that's the key thing which is why I don't view renewables as my competitor, not at all. It's part of a mix. I don't find any credible engineering argument, not emotion, not romantic, a credible engineering argument that says this is how we will um, uh, introduce renewables that can become a dispatchable baseload resource. The South African nuclear experience, which is the key thing, the one you have in Malpostrand, is an immensely positive experience. And the broader impact of nuclear in developing jobs, especially quality of jobs. And I leave you with this thought. What we find in, in, in our business, yes, we do pay a little bit more than what the industry does. But if you take a semi-skilled person, in other words, a person that has passed uh, what I used to know as standard eight, grade 10, who then has no tertiary qualification for whatever circumstance, that person, when working in nuclear and when working for ESCOM, can send the kids to school, firstly, and possibly tertiary education. You break the poverty trap in this kind of industry. I leave you with that thought. Good, thank you everybody. I haven't got a nice presentation to deliver to you, but I want to talk through things from a slightly different angle. And I'm gonna throw in what we've just talked about, our role in the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Energy. Um, I think both speakers have made some really good points today. What I'm gonna talk about is from a position of an industry that's busy delivering an industry that's bringing power onto the grid on time, uh, 200 billion rands worth of investment into South Africa over the last four years, um, and that from an economic point of view, which we've heard from both speakers, is a critical issue given where South Africa stands. So if we contextualize it from our point of view as renewables, and I'll, I'll wear my Renewable Energy Council hat as well, critical to us in our dialogue with government is this issue about can we be many things to many people? The argument has been from our industry, uh, or people looking at our industry, to say, you guys are trying to achieve too much. Government's trying to do too much with these programs. What we have delivered is the 200 billion rands worth of investment. The stalling of the current round is another lost 53 billion rands worth of investment. And that's money that's not coming from government. That's money that private investors are bringing into the country when we have a situation where there is a lack of investment. There's a lack of economic growth. The dearth we've seen in sales, you, you're quite right. It's a, it's a concerning issue for us, is when we see a country doing this economic dip that it has since 2008, and you will realize and understand why we ended up. It wasn't just international issues that we had in 2008. You'll remember we had a fairly significant glitch in our power system in 2008. So from our point of view, we're looking at an industry that's developing, it's bringing in 200 billion rands worth of investment. There's another 50 billion or 53 billion that's due if government signs this current round. <coughs> we've seen prices drop. So whilst we've had to pay for the investment, the important point from our side is that, and, and what we're seeing from government is those prices, they drop as we've invested in technology, much like we've seen in any major technology around the world, is the drop in prices to a point where now literally we're sitting at 60 cents a kilowatt hour for wind and PV. So that investment, the drop, the 30,000 jobs that we've created in a short span of time, we're seeing right now down the road in Belleville, an institution that is internationally recognized, attached to the university, that is training up people both for South Africa and for the African market. So we're not talking about what we'll do in the future, we're talking about what we're delivering at this moment in time. And the argument may well be that what are we going to do because there's excess power at this moment in time. Now sitting with some of the, the transformation work that we're doing with government at the moment, um, I don't know how many of you have looked at the policy documents that are going to be debated later this year or uh, actually in June at the ANC's policy conference. We've talked radical economic transformation. We hear the jargon and we start to say where are these industries of ours? Where is the power sector going to deliver in all of this transformation? Um, the renewable sector, from our point of view, is already delivering 
It's got to deliver better. Governments put some very clear things on the table about what needs to be done. But central to this is this diversification of the power sector. So I agree, nuclear and renewables have all got a place. We're not arguing from our point of view that it's one or the other. We've got a mix. But what we've done in the modeling over the last six to eight months, and you talked about the IRP, the outdated IRP, the new IRP that everybody hears is stuck somewhere in the bowels of government and we're trying to get it out. The issue is that when you look at the unconstrained base case model for South Africa, and that unconstrained means somebody isn't fiddling with, somebody isn't jiggling prices to get one technology in ahead of another. We're simply talking about watching international prices, real prices procured in the bidding rounds in South Africa. Not airy fairy things from international consultancies that are giving us what they think the prices are, but the real prices of coal, of gas, because it's operating in South Africa, now because of nuclear, I mean, uh, sorry, renewables, we can see that. Nuclear, we've got prices for. We're dealing with real prices in South African rands, and we're starting to see that as that model plays itself out, and people are not jiggling with the model, over the next 10 to 15 years, as we see the mix changing, we're going to be paying for the nuclear-adjusted model probably 80 billion rand more per annum than what we need to be paying in the unconstrained model, which allows that optimal, optimal mix of renewable energy sources together with gas. Our view simply is gas and renewables will pr provide that base load that we're talking about. We see it obviously from a clean energy point of view that there does need to be a mix. But that question is, can South Africa afford 80 billion rand or more per year for a plan that forces an excessive amount of one technology over another. So from a ministerial point of view, when we look at how we balance off these things, we say to South Africa, what is that affordability that you've talked about? A, we have to look at this issue of what does happen when growth comes? What does happen if we look today, Minister Davies is opening one of the special economic zones again. We're looking at the growth, the uptake of investment in these zones. What's going to happen? if we don't have that capacity in place now. Secondly, if we look at what's happening with the CEO's initiative, and we look that by 2025, we're going to start seeing that reduction. And we, we've talked about the coal plants. You raise a very good issue. Why don't you keep the old technology? Why don't we refurbish it? If we look at the cost of refurbishing, uh, that doesn't seem to make sense. But we're seeing 27,000 megawatts of power coal-fired plant that will be retired. What do we replace it with and when? And the question for us is simply, how vulnerable can we allow South Africa's economy to be, given the current situation that we're in? Can we continue or can we put forward a plan that says we're going to pay 80 billion rand a year, more than what we need to be paying, if we go for this unconstrained model, which is a, a, a mix of renewables, gas predominantly, some uh, nuclear, and the current uh, plant that we have? If we force this excessive build that we're looking at, it's going to cost us 80 billion rand a year more in the context of the diminishing prices of the renewable build that's bringing in international investment. And I think that's the critical thing for us. It's not simply about the hard technical issues, or those are critical, but it is about the economy. It's about what do we do when the growth comes? Will we once again be caught with our pants around our ankles? We cannot afford to be, and I'll just leave you with some of the figures that I think are quite crucial as we debate the technicalities of our economy and how we deal with the one account and where the money is coming to the one account. 54 million population. 19 million of those people are on the social security system. Of our tax base of that, there's roughly 8 million people that are individual taxpayers in this country of a population of 53 to 54 million. Right? We all know the manufacturing sector, what's happened with the RAND, all the issues you've pointed out for us quite clearly. In that context, where do we get investment? Where do we get the growth? And we're going to get it through a diversity, uh, in the power sector at least, a mix. But a mix that is being able to deliver, that is delivering. From a renewables point of view, we're delivering jobs now. Because of the intricacies of the procurement model, 30% of what is invested or what comes in and the adjudication of these plants when they get awarded goes to socio-economic development. And currently there's a figure of 11 billion rand that is going to be directed and injected directly into rural economies. So we're not talking about what we will do in the future. 
We're talking right now about dispersed generation across South Africa that's training engineers, it's delivering engineers. More importantly, it's ejecting uh, revenue through shareholding and through socioeconomic spend into far-flung parts of the country that is part of our industry solution to start saying, as we look at the burgeoning growth of our urban areas, as we look at that demand for power in our urban areas, as we look at future coal plants shutting down and what we're going to replace them with, because we do have a carbon commitment. We made a very clear carbon commitment internationally, and that requires a cleaner mix. Our view is a cleaner mix is a mix of renewables, gas, uh, and some nuclear. But we have that commitment, and we're going to have to pay at some stage for the silly mistakes we've made in the past. Whether that's too much coal, whether that's coal-fired plants that are sitting there, and the argument is let's not reduce them, let's not take them offline, the question is they have to come offline. We've got a commitment to take them offline, and as you know, if you bought that VW Beetle all those years ago, is that VW Beetle really energy, oil efficient, petrol efficient, etc. today? Probably not. Um, and I think we just need to consider some of those from an investment point of view. Is what are the wise investments that we are making now? Modern technology, distributed generation that's delivering benefits across South Africa, that's creating jobs as we speak, that's delivering infrastructure as we speak on behalf of ESCOM because we know that the ESCOM team are constrained as far as their investment into grid goes. The grid is not being built, it's not been upgraded. So from that point of view, we're saying that <coughs> We've got to find a new mix. We've got to bring that private sector investment in. We've got to make sure that those figures around the national development plan, the growth, et cetera, which is dragging our economy down, which is making us an unattractive investment de destination to many, is actually turned around. And from our point of view, that's what our industry is doing, one small step at a time, decreasing prices with the kind of growth that we're seeing, plant delivered on time, on budget, no expense to the state, and my last point is, as we look at that regulatory clearing account from which ESCOM does recover the money, we're starting to see that the provisions made there that were misspent in the past need to be directed to places that are productive in the South African economy and not to propping up something that hasn't worked for us before. So from our point of view, it's a sunrise industry. We're delivering at the moment. We're delivering at prices that are starting to match the international prices that are much lower than new coal. And as we've seen through the modeling that argue that we need to be doing more of what's cost effective for South Africa but generates the international revenue, the, the uh, investment that creates those jobs. And that's the balance. That's the trade-off at this moment in time. That's the nature of the mix we need to be looking at. But that mix cannot cost South Africa an additional 80 billion rand a year than what it actually really needs to in that optimal mix. So I hope I've been on time. Thank you. Uh, to respond to the previous two speakers, just one or two points that I can link to. I think firstly, I'd like to just commend um, the first speaker, Sadiq, from the aspect of ESCOM and the awards that you've just got with 400 and how many days is it now? 400, 492 days. I think that is incredible. That is one very important lesson that we do need to take out of it, that a unit of Kuburg can run for 492 days without a single trip producing power, completely base load, fully dispatchable, etc. for that time. I think that is a point that we do need to take out of that. I think that's, that's an important thing for us there that we need to take a lesson from. On the other side, from the, from, from the solar and wind side, we, we do need to raise the question gently around, around the take or pay agreements and around the risk. And where does the risk, risk lie in those contracts? Effectively, they are being subsidized, I would say, because there's no risk on the people that are investing. They have a guaranteed market for 20 or 30 years. And that's a peculiarity of the way the South African uh, energy model or the electricity model has been set up at the moment where you have government ownership on the one side, which is equivalent to an EDF model. If you think of it, France runs where the EDF owns everything from the meter to the turbine versus the Californian model where everything is private and people sell in all the time. And at the moment, we sit in the middle, which is a mixed model. And the only way we can bring private suppliers like yourselves to the table is to offer you a take or pay agreement, which is a peculiarity of our situation, but the real Achilles heel for us. So if the, I would say, let's bring the solar industry on board. If you prepare to, to not make the sale, if we don't need it, if the industry is prepared to say, you can dispatch us 
And if we're not needed, like in California, you're welcome to build a plant, but if no one wants to buy it, you carry the risk, Mr. Builder. We don't have that in South Africa, because it's underwritten that every kilowatt hour will be built, will be bought for the next 30, 30 years. That is an issue I have. It's a peculiarity, I'm not blaming you, and it must be great to be in that industry to make your sales for 30 years. I'd love to have a cafe where people said they would buy everything for the next 30 years. It must be lovely. It must be really wonderful, and that's why the banks are lending you the money, I would imagine. So we have to ask some questions around that. I don't know if that model is sustainable because it's just going to drain the bank account when already 10% is coming in and going straight out and not paying for anything. No losses, nothing. And that's just going to mount. It's, it's, it's not sustainable, forgive me. And is that okay? So I think we just need to factor that in as we, as we continue. Thank you. I think uh, Paul, you stole my thunder because that was the primary point I wanted to make. But uh, I'll then move on to uh, the, the second point, which is effectively that I don't view, as I've said earlier, renewables and nuclear to be competitors of each other. How I view it is that nuclear sits in one basket and renewables together with gas and um, storage sits in another. And when I take that basket as a whole, that basket is currently not cost competitive with nuclear. None of that takes away the fact that without demand, all of this is a moot discussion. And then this, the subtext to the discussion on demand is, who knows what it's going to be? Who knows what it's going to be? But to get caught with your pants down, the negative gearing on the economy, when you, when you have demand that is growing and you don't have supply, is quite substantial. So the most compelling um, thought process that I have especially when I think of the future of my kids, we need to play the long game and we need to ensure that we have dispatchable power that is um, there at the flick of a switch. The very last point I want to make is unrelated to the points you made, but you triggered the thought. Often I hear people talk about smart grid technology, and I know it's coming. It's going to come at some point. Many of us hated load shedding. That was South Africa's experience of smart grid technology. It was a Herculean effort on the part of ESCOM and the municipalities and their planning to match demand with supply at the time when supply was limited, using rolling backouts and so on. It's not a pleasant place to be. So for me, the long game is about, if anything, let's err on the side of more power rather than too little. Thank you. The issue just to pick up on, I think, from a safety point of view is whilst we do raise always and we will continue to raise the issue of investment, which is crucial, that investment is not a risk. You're not paying, I'm not paying, well, I'm paying, but none of you are paying in the room for that investment. It's private sector investment that comes in. Uh, yes, they do take the risk. Yes, there are returns that do get made by any investor in any sector, in any technology, and it's the same thing. Invest in the beginning, sometimes your returns are okay. But people have taken a risk in a South African economy with all of those issues of growth, low demand, all the problems that we see yet have made commitments to come and create the jobs, to deliver on time, on budget, connect to the grid. And we've worked extensively with ESCOM to look at how we integrate renewables into the grid. The issue of dispatchability and variability and all these issues have actually been overcome. We launched a report two and a half weeks ago together with ESCOM, the Department of Energy, and the German uh, investment agencies that supported the, the st uh, studies to look at how we will integrate that renewables into the grid. And we know that we can integrate another 30,000 to 40,000 megawatts of renewables into the South African grid without any risk of technical issues. And that came from the ESCOM team that was part of that study. So from our point of view, it's it's an investment that's making sense because it's creating jobs now. It's an investment that as we look to what's going to happen when we turn that economy around, and that's our issue is, what do we do when we sit and there's a turnaround in the economy, we don't have the power, or we're sitting with dirty power where we're now paying carbon taxes on top of what we pay. So as we look at South Africa's kilowatt price today, in whatever that is, add a RAND on, and the University of Pretoria did all those studies, which basically says we don't see that RAND that we pay in terms of impacts on our trade, impacts on job creation, and all that kind of thing. 
It, it's, a, it's an impact that's not understood, and we're paying a rand more than the prices that you hear. And we've got to get ourselves as a country out of that situation where we're constantly paying for things that we don't really need. We're constantly paying penalties, whether they are in jobs, whether it's in trade deficits, whatever it is. That account that you talked about, the bank account, we've got to boost it. The only way we boost it is by investment, job creation, and, the, and, and boosting our economics as an in, interesting and attractive investment destination where people want to put their money. The last thought I will leave you is that if these industries weren't working and weren't attractive, and if government didn't have to put in place mechanisms to at least guarantee, so similar to everybody who invests in a government bond or pension fund, et cetera, who would like to know they've got a guarantee that your pensions are going to be there in 20 years' time, so too every other industry and every other sector looks for some level of guarantees. And yes, we're not at that market liberalization. And we specifically can't go for that route because government says we're a developmental economy. There's things we've got to do to facilitate things slightly differently. And that, some of that was the debate around do we break ESCOM up into the, the generation and the transmission side, do we separate wires from generation, start creating different business models. That is all debate that will take place in June this year from a policy point of view. I would ask you to go and look at those papers from the, the ANC and from government, which will tell you very firmly what the thinking is despite what we hear in the media. And we're going to see movement towards a more decentralized model. We are going to see a movement slowly towards something that is not quite a private sector model, but is going to find a unique blend to solving South Africa's situation. That's why a lot of us from the private sector sit with government to try and push this country in a direction that says we do need the injection, we need the growth, we need the jobs. The cost of the South African consumer, yes, it's always there. You and I are always going to pay for power, whether I generate my own off my roof whether I buy it from ESCOM, whether I buy it at a massive markup from a municipality that's cross-subsidizing, it all comes to the, the question is, over a period of time, can we force the wholesale prices down? Every market around the world where you've injected free fuel, because renewables is free fuel, you don't pay for the fuel, I can tell you what your price will be today, as same as it will be in 100 years' time for wind because you don't pay for the fuel price. We don't have that volatility in the South African economy. The more we remove the volatility, the more we hedge ourselves against that volatility, the higher the positive impact on the GDP, the better the impact on that picture that you've described, is how do we stabilize that? How do we generate income? How do we get that account looking better? Unfortunately, it's one of those utilities that we do have to pay for, uh, but very shortly, the Renewables Council and SAFIR will be launching a website called The Silent Revolution. So that's my promo for two seconds. And that silent revolution is go to any city around South Africa, the big metros, and you will see the growth in solar PV on rooftops. I think it's an issue you mentioned. I think you might have picked up on it as well. But the, literally we're getting to a point where people are doing it for themselves and saying, whilst the big debate gets going, I want power security for myself. Wine farms, fruit producers, households, factories are doing it and it's growing much faster than the power sector that we're talking about. The exponential growth annually is huge. So it says that there's a shift coming in our power sector, and all of us that are in the big power market, including those from government that are looking at policy, are going to have to start examining what that future decentralized, smart grid-based model starts to look like, where consumers become what we call prosumers, producers, and consumers of power and where the citizens start selling power back into the market. That's the value of the renewables revolution around the world. And if the tr sector wasn't attractive, we wouldn't be seeing it growing at between 17 and 20% per annum on an international basis. So let me leave it at that. Those figures are there. Um, both made very valuable points. It's a South African challenge. What do we do with that picture? But to believe that renewables is going to be a burden is the opposite. Much like cell phone technology seeded a whole lot of other things, renewables is at that point where it's busy seeding a, a whole new sector, a whole new way of doing things. And we'll be having a different discussion in five years' time in this room because we'll have seen the impact of what it's done. Not only on the power grid, but those rural communities where people are unemployed and these projects scattered around South Africa are keeping those economies alive and preventing that influx of people to the urban centers. Thank you very much. I'll deal with one of your comments, come questions, which is, what is the cost of nuclear into the future? Now, there's a lot of discussion around that, and people bandy about numbers. 
So I'd prefer to give you a, um, a, a considered answer rather than give you a number. The idea that ESCOM has currently is to do a request for information and then to do a request for proposal to understand what the cost of build will be. Those numbers will then be plugged back into a business case and from that we get what we call a levelized cost of electricity and from that number we then determine if the business case works. So in other words, um, the, the, what's called the overnight cost of, of build will determine whether it is affordable and in fact profitable to buy nuclear plants. Why the focus on Kuburg is because it's real. And currently, it's the cheapest plant in ESCOM to run. It's highly profitable. The pattern, and this is where I differ even from financial analysts, the pattern of nuclear is the build is complex, the build is expensive, undoubtedly so. Once you're through that phase, you have a 15 to 20 year period of, let's say, paying off your initial debt, after which, because of the low input cost of fuel and the reliability, both of which are high, um, key drivers to the levelized cost of electricity. Because they are so stable and so low, or, or the reliability high and, and input cost low, you have a business that after you've paid off, after you've gotten through the, the, the trouble of constructing and paying off the construction cost, you've got a very profitable machine. And that's the pattern that Kuburg proves unequivocally, not theoretically. Yeah, briefly, um, just to pick up on your points about storage issue. In South Africa, we've got massive storage capacity. So let's not talk about the new technologies. There's guys in Midrand from a company called Blue Nova. There's uh, the Tesla equivalent, which was started many years ago, called Freedom One, operating at that small scale. Um, but you've got a grid and you've got pump storage. Um, so you have that storage capacity that doesn't necessarily need to waste that energy. When we did the simulations and uh, looking at 40,000 megawatts, uh, transposed across South Africa, there's no place in South Africa uh, where the wind doesn't blow at some stage uh, and where the power hasn't been, uh, uh, hasn't been necessary. So if you look at, although it might be taken pay agreements, that power has been needed. In the work that we've done with ESCOM, the modeling that we've done with ESCOM into the IRP, if we start looking at when we need this power, what it's going to cost, if anybody here is in doubt, go and look at the IRP. It's on the Department of Energy's website. It gives you a sense of what the costing is going to be, and it tells you what we're going to be paying over which period of time, hence all of this modeling. And I think it's really important that we inform ourselves so that at the end of the day, when we do talk about these things as citizens, we make informed decisions uh, about our future. And you can question what I'm saying to you, what any of us are saying to you, and it's there for public consumption. And that's a very important part of our country is that we haven't had what we call energy democracy that has armed the citizens to make those decisions for themselves and participate in that debate. Um, but in there will be the numbers that I think are being used at the moment around nuclear and other technologies. Um, and that base case does say that nuclear is fairly expensive. So the process of going through this RFI will tell you very quickly and, and the RFP will tell you very quickly whether those assumptions are real because you can't work off Kuberg costs anymore. Those are sunk costs, as Mr. Koko will tell us, from many years ago. We've got to look at what it's going to cost now and into the future. So that we've still got to test. Luckily with us, we've got prices on the table and they're decreasing. We can make those assumptions fairly comfortably. So hopefully that answers some of your questions, is that we're getting to those barriers, those hurdles that we've always thought are there are starting to diminish. Thanks. Oh, just that guess. The, 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 on, the only comment I would make is that I believe gas needs to play an important part of our mix and gas would work very well with the renewables to cover during the times when there is no renewable. The backup would be gas. Natural gas based plant, by the way, sorry, not, not, not just, to, just to counter my partner on the left here, it's, it's, not, it's not diesel based. The gas turbines are diesel based, which is very expensive. I'm talking natural gas. When, once we have natural gas, either from the Karoo or coming in from one of the neighboring countries, that is the best that we can have to, to, to manage the renewable intermittency. You would do it by, by, by natural gas. That's what you need. The next question, Paul, which is, um, what natural gas in the Karoo? <laughs> okay, let me just answer that. 
no, no, no. Just to, let me just uh, let me yeah. Yeah, t just just to say, I mean, they are looking at the natural gas in the Karoo, but don't underestimate what is available in northern Mozambique. The fines are gigantic. Sassel built the Sassel pipeline to Pemba, I mean to to Tamani, on a three trillion cubic feet find. Three. They have, a, they have identified about 100 trillion cubic feet already in Pemba. They're going to be, be launching the, the building of the gas trains to do liquefied natural gas to export to Japan shortly. We can definitely buy into that gas and bring it through here. Absolutely, unequivocally, it, is a, it will become available for us. Right. I'll deal with your first question. Um, the first I'll give you, I, I suppose, what I could call my mandated answer. The second I'll give you my own. I hope you're not recording this. The, the mandated answer is that DOE has that function. They do that to understand or try and predict what the future demand uh, will be. In terms of my own view of the world, if I owned ESCOM for a day, I make a lot of money, but if I owned ESCOM for a day, I'd say, you, South Africa, held me accountable for load shedding. Lot, lots of the, the inputs to that problem was my own doing. Some of it wasn't. You stopped me from building new plant when I wanted to. And then I stayed silent once you told me to, to be quiet. So if I own ESCOM for a day, I'll say, since I'm accountable to you, for when you flick the switch, I want to decide what I think the future demand will be. With accountability goes some sort of responsibility and there must be some degree of empowerment. So that's my personal answer to you. Perhaps just me to throw something in. Um, one of the things we do sit with in uh, South Africa generally is what we term a trust deficit. And that's where your question comes from. We ask ourselves, can we trust anybody who's making decisions anymore? We see that the context as it uh, starts getting a lot more muddy, people start saying, can I trust any decisions made anyway? Because it seems that there's all this interest. We've got to get ourselves out of that very fast. We don't have a, a, a magic solution to that, but somehow we've got to figure out how we do planning in an imperfect context. Secondly, if you do go look at that IRP, if you look at the different institutions that are putting in their information into the IRP, um, and it's what we've considered in the Ministerial Committee, is we looked at the University of Pretoria study, for example, who've turned around and said, folks, the demand side thing is just clearly lacking. It's, it's very, very thin. The whole premise that every kilowatt hour not used is the cheapest kilowatt hour hasn't somehow found its way into this. And you can see why that is. It's because we're struggling to get information even out of the municipalities, out of the metros, to look at what their own demand profile is. So it's a massive exercise to go down to every municipality, every area of the country, aggregated provincially. And I know I worked on energy planning in the Western Cape with this for quite some time. Um, and it was a huge exercise. And then, of course, the question comes in when you take all of that up to another level, then you start getting the different levers being pulled by different interests. And that's never going to go away. So we're going to continually work in this environment of imperfect information. But you're right, the starting point, as the guys at the University of Pretoria pointed out, was why are we not getting to grips with that demand? The second one is if we do get to grips with it, who here in this room or anywhere else in any of the ministerial committees can actually sit with that crystal ball and say, how's the South African economy going to grow? What size, what speed, what volume? We know what it needs to be. The NDP tells us what it needs to be, but how? We're struggling to get there. We were meant this year to be at at least 35 to 3.8% growth. We're sitting at less than 1%. Just is not working. So something's wrong. And part of that, people will argue, come to the psyche of South Africans where we keep talking ourselves into a hole, creating arguments that the outside world turn around and look at us and go, do we really want to be there? And that's a major problem, is that whilst we're all sitting arguing and fighting about things, people are taking their money and going elsewhere. We're seeing it in our industry as people refuse to sign PPA contracts and haggle about how much it's actually going to be. That bank account we're talking about there is just getting less and less because nobody's putting any money in. They're going to Nigeria of all places. They're going to Kenya. They're going to North Africa, but they're not putting it in here. And that's what we've got to turn around. So whilst we have our arm wrestling about our issues, the bigger order issue for me is how do we turn that confidence around? And that's something South Africans have got to do pronto as a collective. 
sorry, it's a bit of a wishy-washy one to the technical stuff, but... Just to add from a technical mm -hmm. side, I think, I don't, know, I don't know how good the modeling is from a demand side because I don't know how much they're taking into account the price elasticity. I think it is far more than, they re than they're actually taking into account. As the price continues to rise of electricity, people are switching away. And that price elasticity, all the years, has never been included. I mean, I, mean, I used to be involved in electricity demand forecasting. And, and that was never included, whereas it's become now. And, and as the price continues to rise in the years ahead, there's even more price elasticity going to be impacting it. So that's what makes the demand calculation so difficult um, on the one hand. So, so that has to be modeled correctly. The other issue I have is that the IRP is all done about what is the least cost and what is going to be the cheapest thing to do. Yeah. What no one manages is the bank account, and that's why I raise it so strongly, because it falls under a different department. What you would find is the Department of Energy is simply coming up with what should we be tendering for based on the IRP, but they don't look at the bank account in the IRP. They don't look at running costs, they don't look at the losses, non-technical, technical, etc. None of that is taken into account. That is actually done under the Department of Public Enterprises. It's a different department. And that is the fundamental issue here because no one's managing the bank account and is trying to in terms of the future. No one is projecting the bank account going forward. They're all looking at what stations we should buy. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll start with your second part first in terms of the distribution. Um, that's why part of what we term the silent revolution is exactly this problem which the metros have experienced is just this massive increase in rooftop solar. Uh, whether it's clear water mall, this small residential shopping centers, whatever. And it's been very hard. Um, we're getting to a point now where in, in a couple of weeks time we're launching a thing called the PV Green Card. And part of that process is working with all the major metros in South Africa a, to start looking at that forecasting because a lot of people are connecting systems and they're not telling either the regulator or the city about it. But they're wiring them up so that they can feed back into the grid when that legislation is in place. And that is a particular risk for a whole lot of reasons. And initially cities just ignored it and said it's not going to happen. They now know it's happening and they know it's happening at an increasing, or uh, as some official put to me the other day, at an alarming rate. Um, so your point about people doing power for themselves and the whole equation changing, grid defection, is what's going to happen. And the cities have now realized, metros and the work we do with ESCOM, is that we've got to get a handle on what this actually means. Otherwise people are just going to do it. Uh, and we're going to end up with a mess. So part of the PV green card will be to work with the different agencies, with ESCOM, to make sure that we can start doing some of that prediction, some of those better forecasting but at, a, at a, a city and a municipality level. So that's the one. In terms of jobs, you're right, the, the majority of the jobs are during construction. Over the 14 to 18 months of construction, I mean, we're down to nine months now. As people are able to build that 75 megawatts in nine months, it's, it's quite a quick turnaround. So it is in construction, it's in the ancillary services, it's in the, the maintenance part of it is fairly limited. Um, so if I had to give you a ratio and say, for every 10 people in development, the developer project, when you're going to construction, that, that scales up to 400 people. And then in the, let's call it the maintenance side, that scales down to about 25 or 30. So that'll give you that kind of sense of where the jobs are. But where South Africa is going is now in the component part. So if you start to look at all everything from cable ties to cables to the racking, the shelving, all of that, in that front end of, of the, the manufacturing, that's where South Africa's been losing because everybody's doing it overseas. It's not coming here because the, for, for a whole lot of reasons. And that's where we work with the trade unions to start looking now at how we're going to boost that. But it's crucial to South Africa's economy. But again, the investors, the big guys who have got plant overseas will say to you, I'm doing it in China for X, I'm doing it in Indonesia for Y, I'm doing it in Europe for Z, why would I come to South Africa? Tell me what you can offer me. And that's, again, these special economic zones. So we've got a challenge. How do we attract manufacturing, whatever it may be? But I hope that gives you a sense of where the scale is. So it's not in the operations. But the B part of it, um, briefly, is that part of that distributed solar plant is the money from that plant. There's a commitment to government through the economic development spend that we have to start seeding rural economies and local economies, secondary economies. Because it's not just about that PV plant. It's about what's that legacy left behind. And South Africa has a painful history out of mining that now as we close mines down and we see communities being shut down, we cannot allow that to happen again from an economic point of view and hence government shifting tack to say you've got to invest in local economies but in the secondary part. So sorry for the long-winded reply but I hope that gives you a sense.
It's a, it's a question that I've been warned not to answer. You know, <laughs> but, but I don't think I don't think that's right. I think we must try and answer those questions. You asked an, your, your question is very layered. So the first on corruption, I despise corruption. Any form of it should be stamped out, and if there's any wind of that, I believe that people must be held accountable. That's what our country needs. That's a personal view. So the view that is more helpful to you is um, trying to answer what is the decision-making process. So again, it's got multiple layers. The first is out of my hands. I'm a small fish in that pond, which is the IRP, the public debates, the discussions, what the final IRP will look like. There is layer one in the decision-making going forward. Layer two is the outcome of the request for information, the request for proposal, how those are plugged back into the business case, and what the affordability is of um, things going forward. Now, a little bit of um, uh, the, uh, um, um, education on how the ESCOM process works, who's now the designated procurer, we develop, um, in, in the ideal scenario, we develop a business case based on levelized cost, based on return on investment, uh, hurdle rates on integrated, uh, um, um, I forgot the term now. So we'd look at standard financial indicators to tell us whether the spend we're planning is in fact profitable for ESCOM. So that's how we determine our budget. And that would be based on the estimated prices plus contingencies. We then, once that is approved, go into a commercial process which is an absolutely, I'm going to say relatively transparent process, but let me explain what relative means. You cannot take vendor's information and spread it to the general public. Those, that's private information. But it's transparent in the sense that it is audited, it is externally audited. ESCOM has a system of forensics, whistleblowers, 40,000 people, perhaps overstaffed, I'm not so sure. But not everybody's friends, so you have a system that is, in my experience, extremely robust on the commercial side. In this particular case, because pricing is so important and the overnight cost of what the, the new plants might cost is so important and the business case is sensitive to, to those prices, our plan is to understand what the prices are through the commercial process. So it's slightly the other way around. Then we firm up our business case. And the business case then has to prove not only internally to ESCOM whether the bank account can service that debt, it must also serve, um, uh, it must also get the approval of National oh. Treasury, which is an external body. So the decision making going forward in summary would be the IRP determines the mix, then the business case determines the affordability, and the commercial process determines the vendor. Did I come close? Thank you, I mean, it is helpful. Um, this is not, not all questions, I think, are removed out of the scenario, but it's helpful. May I just add that the, the other decision that is taken is the customer will choose what he and what he isn't going to buy. And I think that's going to become a bigger issue on the other side here. And that's what the big problem with the bank account is that customers will more and more start to choose to do their own thing and we're going to see more and more people supplying themselves, moving away from the grid. And that is where the whole bent towards just procurement on the, on the utility side is, is, is going to cause a train smash going ahead. And so the decisions are being taken based on an IRP that's not really factoring that in correctly. But, but this, the simple approach, I agree with, with, my, with our other delegate here, that it's the IRP that is determined. We are still looking at the nuclear today. We are still looking at the fourth round of the, of the solar and wind today, trying to get the signatures based on it directly on an IRP that was, that was set out about, about seven or eight years ago, and it is the minister's determination. The way the act reads is the Minister of Energy determines what we can or we can't build at the end of the day. And so all the power is vested in, in the minister, and, and that's the issue. But what is not, not vested with the minister, and the one right we have, and we must fight tooth and nail to retain it, is if I want to do something with solar in my own home or my own business, or wind or micro hydro or whatever, I have the freedom to do it behind the meter. We have the freedom to generate for ourselves at the moment. I don't have to have a license for that. And we have to fight for that tooth and nail. 
But that's what's going to cause the divergence between the two sides, and that's going to cause the bankrupting of the of that with the price escalation is going to cause the bankrupting of the account of the business account at the end of the day. Just a couple of brief words from my side on your comment. I think you've explained it very well in terms of how we break up that decision making. I think the important thing comes back down to that integrated resource plan. So this latest one that is sitting waiting for approvals, which we are now told will happen by probably September, October this year, is going to be crucial in terms of that picture going forward because it's got to inform an investment decision for South Africa. And that investment decision, as you pointed out, is absolutely crucial. And the plan, as it stands now, is going to cost 80 billion rand more a year than what it needs to cost. And that's what we need to be interrogating, is why are we going for plans that have a mix that cost us 80 billion rand more than what it could cost us. And, and it's that transparency which we've been arguing for. Now, luckily, as we've moved this process forward, it's, it's often stuff that in the public domain, we know everything from fake websites to misfed news to whatever. We sit in that public domain where we often don't know what to believe. Luckily, in the ministerial committees, we sit with this information firsthand. And we look at that and we argue for this thing. Now, I don't know how the new minister will stack up. She's got to find her feet. Um, what we do know is the previous minister was very clear with us when she sat us all down in an advisory committee and said, I don't care which political persuasion you're from. I don't care whether you criticize me tomorrow in the Mail and Guardian. Whatever you do in this room, you've got to come up with a plan that's suitable for South Africa, given we are going to be putting South Africa Inc.'s money on the table for a very long period of time. And we are planning for many years in advance and making that investment. We better be sure it's the right investment the least cost investment for South Africa and the most prudent and hopefully the most modular from our point of view that allow us to withdraw or to add more as we go. If we start building massive more Madupis, we're actually doomed because those plans were made years ago and that's where we sit now, is we're reaping the harvest of that decision making back then which said big is better. Big is not better, small is better for all the reasons that we've just pointed out is because people can better match their own supply and demand at different levels as technology advances and allows us to do that. So it's, it's very difficult, but that decision making, as we've pointed out, technically is very crisp. Politically it's not crisp because there's people at the end of the day who somebody's going to be accountable if they make the wrong decision, they're committing South Africa to 50 years worth of very bad investment decisions. And that's where we need to be vigilant, both from industry side as well as from government side, because collectively it's our home, it's South Africa, we don't really have anywhere else to go. Well, maybe we could, but we've got to look after this one while we can make the most prudent decisions. So, it's the soft answer, but there you have it. <laughs>